And this is a, a study from 2005. It was a meta-analysis of many, many different trials that looked at the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase uh, C677T uh, mutation. And there's also a 1298 mutation, but this is the one they looked at. And if you're used to looking at these meta-analyses, these are data from multiple different studies and the overall odds ratio for thrombophilic risk for each study is shown in this box. Okay, so this line here, the dark black line, is the line essentially of no, no additional risk. So no increase, no decrease risk. So you can see that most of these studies on average, and this is the average down here, had an increased risk of thrombosis of 1.15. So, I mean, that means that people with a higher homocysteine were 1.15 times more likely to have thrombosis, which is really almost nothing. And these are the 95% confidence interval, intervals that go from 1.02 to 1.3, so really almost nothing. Now, th these are studies from Europe. When they then looked at studies from the United States, the overall thrombophilic risk of this mutation was really not significant at all. And it, you know, it's really not that much different, but what the authors actually inferred from these studies in the U.S. with no change was the fact that our breakfast cereals here are fortified with B vitamins, so that may have decreased um, the, the, the risk in the United States uh, any further. So really, I think the MTHFR mutation, it, it's one I've really stopped doing in a reflex manner when the homocysteine level is elevated because I think it really adds, adds nothing. Uh, you know, and individuals almost have to be homozygous for MTHFR to have a thr any thrombophilic risk and probably have to be B12 or folate deficient as well. So this is a case to illustrate this point. A 55-year-old male with a recurrent uh, DVT no history of malignancy. His proton PTT are fine. He doesn't have any congenital protein C, protein S, or antithrombin, but his homocysteine level is elevated. His factor V lagnin and his prothrombin uh, mutation are normal. So what would you do with this individual? Why does he have a recurrent um, DBT? Well, one of the other mitigating factors with elevated homocysteine uh, is that it's associated with renal failure. And he has a high BUN and a high creatinine, and the, the chronic renal failure uh, perhaps could be associated with the recurrent DBT. I'm not really sure. I, I doubt whether the homocysteine really is. Elevated homocysteine um, can also be seen in nutritional vitamin B12 deficiency as well. Uh, so you know, it, anemia would be another thing you'd want to look at to see why the homocysteine uh, was elevated. So in this case, I'd say the moral here is that homocysteine can be elevated in renal failure. Certainly don't test for MTHFR um, in this setting and looking for any genetic abnormalities. So some other ge general recommendations is that after you've identified a known thrombophilia, say you find somebody with factor V Leiden, do you stop? Probably not because in you know, that multiplex slide that I showed you that if you have more than one abnormality, your thrombotic risk goes up. So whereas an individual is solely a factor V Leiden heterozygote state, most physicians wouldn't treat them lifelong uh, with warfarin. But if they have factor V Leiden, perhaps and a lupus anticoagulant, you might want to keep them on warfarin uh, for long term. So you should really do laboratory testing for other inherited and acquired thrombophilias because really more than one can coexist, really compounding your risk uh, for thrombosis. And this is illustrated here, case number four. This was a 17-year-old male um, who developed shortness of breath during high school football practice. He was taken to the hospital and he was found not only to have uh, a left lower extremity deep vein thrombosis, he also had a pulmonary embolism. They ordered thrombophilia testing on him. Um, his protein PTT were normal. His protein C, protein S, and antithrombin were normal. His factor VIII was elevated. It was probably an acute phase uh, response because he had an acute DVT. And he was found to be heterozygous for factor V Leiden. So would you stop there? Well, we did the rest of the panel, and it turns out that he was also heterozygous for the prothrombin mutation. And interestingly, in, in looking up his, his history, I thought I recognized his last name. And sure enough, we had done thrombophilia testing on his father before. 
And the patient's father was also a compound heterozygote for both factor V Leiden and the prothrombin mutation. And interestingly, his father, in addition, has a lupus anticoagulant. And his father has had multiple episodes of of DVT and pulmonary embolism. His one sister was also heterozygous for both, and his brother was only a factor V Leiden um, heterozygote. So I think it, this is a good instance where a family can have more than one um, abnormality and certainly can lead to a very thrombophilic uh, phenotype. So the moral of this one is that multiple risk factors can certainly magnify uh, the thrombotic risk. Factor, f factor 8 was also another point of discussion at the consensus conference, and factor 8 activity um, has been variously associated in many studies with an increased risk of, of venous thrombosis. But the group thought that it was controversial, really, to routinely measure factor 8 levels uh, as a risk factor for thrombophilia, largely because what we're looking at is an increased factor 8. And our factor 8 assays in the lab are really designed and developed for looking at hemophilia, for really looking for low factor 8 levels, the way the QC is done, the way the curves are set up. And there's a lot of variability uh, in looking at actually high levels of, of factor 8. We also don't know how high the factor 8 level has to be to be a good thrombotic risk. Is it a little bit above the normal range? Is it double the normal range? Is it you know, 300, 400, 500 percent? There's a lot of uh, controversial data out there. So there's really no good diagnostic cutoff uh, established in the literature. However, it probably is useful to look at factor VIII activity as an additive effect when you found some other thrombophilic uh, risk. So in, in families that may have, say, factor V Leiden also looking at factor VIII. So in this case, this was a 52-year-old male who developed a DVT three days after uh, hip replacement. His pro time was 10 seconds, his PTT was 52, clearly elevated. His protein C and his protein S are normal. His antithrombin came back at 72% and our normal range is about 84 to 125. His factor VIII level was 350% and our normal range is 50 to 134. And his, he wasn't, didn't have any of the genetic abnormalities, factor V or the prothrombin. Because his factor VIII was high, we also did fibrinogen and C-reactive protein, both of which were elevated, clearly saying that this is probably an acute phase response. He's three days after hip surgery. Um, he's you know, got an acute DVT, so he's got reasons to have an acute phase response. So why is his antithrombin low? So is he antithrombin deficient? Heparin. Yeah, his PTT is 52. He's on IV heparin therapy. Typically, your antithrombin levels go down uh, with, with heparin therapy, especially if you've got a prothrombotic uh, tendency. Usually, with heparin, you won't see antithrombin levels down less than about 60%. So, if you see somebody with an antithrombin of 20%, it's probably not to be blamed on heparin. So the moral in this one is that an elevated factor VIII with an acute phase response I think is a doubtful thrombotic risk factor. Uh, most of the studies that indicate factor VIII as a thrombotic risk factor are in patients that don't have an acute phase response. The decreased antithrombin in this case is probably heparin therapy. So at the end, let's talk about when um, and how uh, to measure this. Well, when would you want to look for venous thrombophilia? Um, you could say that, well, during an acute event, like a th in an acute thrombosis or postoperatively, antithrombin protein C and protein S can actually go down. They can get consumed with an acute thrombosis. They can have changes during an acute phase response. Probably not a great time to do it. So it's preferable not to test for these during an acute event, but if you go ahead and do it, and you find a normal value, you've pretty much excluded antithrombin, protein C, and protein S deficiency. So sometimes we will test during the acute event. Sometimes it's good to test during the acute event when they you know, come in before they put them on heparin, you get a sample so that you don't have a heparin effect or a warfarin effect. Often in acute, um, in, in, in my experience, it's, it's not as common, I think, as you, know, you might expect that the antithrombin is really, really low. Uh, with an acute event. So if it's normal, it, it pretty much excludes a congenital deficiency.